Good evening and welcome to the midweek service on Tuesday night. A little bit different this week as we celebrate Thanksgiving on this Thursday. Many of our folks are traveling out of town and just tomorrow night be baking goods and getting ready, ready for the family feast on Thursday. So we're going to have the service tonight on, t on Tuesday night. So we welcome you. Thank you for your prayers and for all the blessings that God has given to us. We thank him. And what a, what a great uh, year we've had at Mount Avenue Baptist Church and Calvary Christian School. Record-breaking years in so many ways. Thankful for the people who've been saved, the lives that have been changed, and those that have grown in the Lord. And we've all grown. It's been a tough year. Um, as we started out with the theme, God First, and uh, got into February and March, and the pandemic hit, and we've just all been looking to God. But I'm thankful that God has met our needs all along the way. And He's blessed each one of us individually and the church corporately our school and i'm just so thankful to him for all the influence that he allows us to have through the gospel of jesus christ through the eternal word of god and i'm so thankful for it thankful for our, our ministries even though we're kind of on hold our sunday school our master's clubs the bus ministry our public school ministries so many different areas um, that we have had outreach in the past or just kind of on hold right now. But don't worry, they'll be back. And we'll have opportunities to tell others about Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, lived the perfect life, died upon the cross, rose again the third day. He's alive forevermore. Because he lives, we live. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And we have this great knowledge of Jesus Christ we know that the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so, so much to be thankful for what God has done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do in the future in all of our lives as we just look to him. So thank you for joining us tonight. I want to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you so much for your participation in the ministry here, your prayers, your attendance when we've been open. You're watching online. Um, and tuning in online each week and uh, we're just thankful for that and thankful for your faithfulness in giving and tithing and giving to missions we've been able to continue to support our, our, our missionaries and the ministries and we just um, I just thank the Lord and I thank you for your faithfulness in giving and to continue to pray for our church of course Mr. Skuzinski you know brother Theo uh, has the coronavirus. Um, I think he's doing better, and I, I'm thankful for that. And uh, we continue to look to the Lord on his behalf. And we have Nick and Hannah have been had tested have tested positive young couple um, teaching in our school, and uh, we have two others uh, that have tested positive. And so uh, we're just looking to the Lord. These are all young, young people, other than Brother Theo. And uh, Brother Theo, I'm thankful, is doing good. Pray for Mar Beth, uh, that the Lord would keep that virus from her. But we're looking to God. Um, but because of the just the, uh, the amount of people that have been exposed to the coronavirus, uh, we're going to do online services for the church this Sunday also. So we'll keep you posted from week to week. But we want to... We want to be wise. We're thankful that we can meet. We're thankful that we have met. We're thankful that uh, we've been able to assemble and see one another, but we want to be safe. And uh, First and foremost is your health physically and your health spiritually. You can uh, be sure and be in the Word of God daily and uh, uh, join us online for the services on Sunday. And just pray for one another as we celebrate again Thanksgiving. And uh, we look forward to uh, all that God has for us during these, these difficult days, but, but days of praise as we look to him. So thank you for, again for joining tonight, I'm praying for those that are traveling, those that are, uh, have some spiritual uh, discouragement possibly. And maybe I, I just pray that this 
message maybe tonight will be a blessing to you. As Dr. David Gibbs, we've we've uh, tapped into him. You know, he's been here uh, several times to our church. Thankful for his friendship and his love for people and uh, his love for the Word of God. And I pray that he'll be a blessing to you tonight as you listen as Dr. David Gibbs brings our message uh, as our guest speaker tonight. God bless you again. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon as, uh, as God um, allows it to, allows us to be together. God bless you now. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew chapter 6. The book of Matthew chapter 6. There's a fella on TV about once a year who really captures my attention. His name is Joey Chestnut. How many of you know who Joey Chestnut is? Joey Chestnut holds the record for eating the most hot dogs <laughs> in 10 minutes of anybody on planet Earth. And people come from around the world to compete. This last year, he ate 70 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Now that is 20,010 calories. That's one hot dog every eight and a half seconds. You gotta admire that. I mean, <laughs> wow. By the way, how many of you like hot dogs? Hold your hand up, will you? If you don't like hot dogs, I do not know what you're gonna do at the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> because they'll be, they'll be serving Randy's Donuts and hot dogs, all right? That'll be at the marriage supper. After he did the 70 hot dogs, he ate 179 chicken wings in 10 minutes. And he's not a big guy. Now, the reason that it catches me is A, I like hot dogs. But B, when they question him after he's done all of these eating feats, they say, why do you do it? Why do you do it? And he always says two things. He says, this is my mission in life. To eat hot dogs and chicken wings faster than anybody else can gulp them down. This is my mission. And then he says, number two, this is what gives me significance. Can I ask you this question tonight? What is it that's your mission? What is it that gives you significance? What is it that gives you that this is why I'm here? Now, in the passage we're about to read in the book of Matthew, Chapter 6. I want you to start with me at verse 9. And I want you to notice very carefully what the Lord says here. Sometimes we refer to this as the Lord's Prayer. And he didn't say recite this prayer, although I think memorizing it is a great idea. But he doesn't say, use these words. He said, after this manner, therefore pray ye our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But would you underscore these next words? But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Deliver us from evil. What this prayer said is, Father, it's all about you your name, your kingdom, your power. 
and deliver us from evil because all of a sudden, for significance in our lives, we start thinking that for me, life is about me. For you, life is about you. And suddenly, significance becomes whatever enters into your mind. And God says, I want to deliver you from that evil. The Bible says that there is a sin that started war in heaven. It's the sin of pride. When the devil decided and lifted up himself and five times said, I will, I will, I will. And that pride now has come down to earth. And this pride, which every one of us has to battle, is what gives most people significance. Well, if I do say so, I'm proud of my career. I'm proud of how I look. I'm proud of what I accomplished. I'm proud of what I own. I'm proud of my toys. I'm proud of, and suddenly the very sin that started war in heaven has grafted its way in. Now, when Jesus enumerated the sins, the seven sins that he particularly despised, pride made the list. And when pride is in our life, oh, it gives us a significance. And that's why God says, deliver us from evil. It's not about my power, it's about your power. It's not about my kingdom, whatever that may be. It's about thy kingdom. And God says, I don't want you to get your significance with the pride, the sin in your life. I want you to get your significance delivered from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Can I remind you that when David sinned with Bathsheba, the Bible records that four people died. But when through pride, when David sinned and numbered the people, 70,000 people died. If you wonder whether God takes pride seriously, he does. And if you're only going to hear one thing tonight, we're about to read in the scriptures God says, I will resist the proud. Do you understand if you have pride in your life tonight, you have God against you. Now, no one in their right mind wants to leave here with God against them. But if you have pride, you've got God against you. People call our ministry all the time and there's catastrophic things going on, just catastrophic things. And they say, Brother Gibbs, we don't know how to explain what all is happening. And I always tell them, well, let me ask you this question. Have you got any pride in your life? What's that got to do with all this? Well, the Bible says that God will resist you. The all-powerful God, the God with whom nothing is impossible, said, if you have pride, I'm against you. And that is said to the Christian. Oh, Brother Gibbs, I don't think God means that. Oh, I promise you, he does mean it. And that's why this is such an incredible thing. That's why it says, and deliver us from this evil of thinking it's about us and not about him. Turn to the book of James, if you would, please. James chapter four.
If I'm going to resist pride, and, and please listen to me, if you don't fear pride, you, you're seriously in trouble. Well, Brother Gibbs, I don't think I'm proud. That's a proud statement. Every one of us has to battle pride of somehow this life is about me. And it's about my goals and my dreams and the things I want and how I think it should go. And God says, deliver us, for thine is the kingdom and the power. One of the things that I love about this ministry so much is Pastor Chapel has focused so keenly and laser-like on the fact that it isn't man that's done this, it's God's that's done this. And these buildings and this ministry exists for the glory of God. But I want you to look at what it says, starting at verse four in chapter four, the book of James. And whenever you read the book of James, remember, this was written by the half-brother to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, this man would have grown up in the home with Jesus as a child. Uh, I just can't imagine what it would be like to grow up with a perfect brother. Can't you hear the mom saying, why can't you be like your brother? <laughs> wow. Verse 4, chapter 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. What a statement. Now, this is addressed to Christians. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, and that's the Holy Spirit that is in you the day you get saved, lusteth the envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The only way to defeat pride is through humility. If you can't exalt humility in your life, then pride will come in and take that vacuum and will handle it. If you're going to do it, please write these four things down. Number one, the scripture is clear from this passage. It cannot be done in our strength. Note what it says. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. It's God who does it. You're sitting here right now saying, how do I get rid of the pride in my life? It's humanly impossible. Paul said, without him you can do nothing. But God says, I want to help you, but it starts with grace. And if you're going to do it, then you've got to do the second thing, and that is resist the devil. Look at verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, the way I get rid of pride, Dr. R, is by humility. But if I don't humble myself, pride's unstoppable. But I've got to resist the devil. My wife and I bought a home in the country, and uh, we really enjoyed it was a small farm, but we ran into a problem. Uh, one day we're in our home and my wife said, something is running around in the attic. And I said, well, that's a problem because we don't have an attic. <laughs> and you could sit there at night and whatever it was that was running around up there, you could hear it taking steps it was big enough that you could hear its footprints. And my wife said, what do you think that is? I said, I don't know, but I think it's a rat. Now, I grew up on farms and we saw a lot of rats, but I never saw one where you could hear its footprints <laughs> while it was walking along. 
my wife said, let's get an exterminator out here. Well, this guy came out, really an unusual man. <laughs> he said, my specialty is getting rats and then I cook them and eat them. And I said, I don't care what you do with them, just get them. <laughs> well, we're describing everything to him. And he said, let me show you something. He said, this is a big rat. We had new cupboards that were solid wood, solid cherry. And the rat was eating holes so it could go from cupboard to cupboard. And normally a rat hole is like that. Well, the, this rat was eating holes like this. You could stick your arm through them. He said, this rat has got serious teeth and this rat is big. He said, I'm gonna put traps out. Well, he put them out everywhere and boy, they were huge. And he baited them all up. Came back in two days and I said, man, I'll bet you got them because I hear those traps going off. He brought them all back down and he said, I don't know how to tell you this, but the rat ate the traps. <laughs> Here's all the little metal pieces, but where there was food and it got on the wood. And I mean, some of those traps were like, the, the rat ate it. He said, this is a first for me. I said, well, it's a first for us, too. What do we do now? <laughs> he said, well, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to poison them. So he said, now, whatever you do, don't let your dogs get at this stuff or any other animal. It'll kill them dead. But he put these little poison wafers everywhere, a couple hundred of them. Came back in two days. I said, I want to tell you this. We still hear them walking around. He went up there and he said, he has eaten all of the wafers. It appears he likes them. <laughs> I said, let me get this right. He ate the traps and now he ate the poison wafers, right. I said, what do you do now? He said, well, this is my last resort. He said, I have a cat that is the meanest cat on planet Earth. And he said, I only bring the cat in as a last resort. And he brought this cat. I have never seen a more ugly cat than this one. <laughs> this cat has scars on it. One ear is missing. I mean, this cat looked at me and he went <laughs> I said, what are you going to do with that cat? He said, I'm going to turn him loose up there and let the cat get the rat. Now, my wife said, well, boy, that sounds cruel. And the guy said, well, would you like to live with the rat? She said, no, let the cat do it. Came back two days. The rat killed the cat. <laughs> the guy comes down holding the cat. This cat's like this. He said, I can't believe this rat. I said, what do you do now? He said, the only thing I know to do is go up there and shoot it. But he said, it'll do damage. We'll hit pipes and wires, and... but we got to nail it. The guy climbs up in the attic and he comes back down and he said, the rat is challenging me. <laughs> Man, we hear him going pow, 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 and pow, 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 pow. He comes back down. He says, you got any water? I said, yeah, did you get him? He said, no, not yet. It took him half a day 
to kill that rat. When he brought the rat down, that rat, not its tail, the body, was easily that length. Its teeth were like that. I said, you gonna eat him? He said, you want me to invite you? I said, no. He said, I've never had such a difficult rat. But he said, the choice was simple. You either get used to living with it, or you gotta take drastic steps. You know what the problem with pride is? It's so difficult to get rid of that we get comfortable with it. I know I shouldn't feel like this, but I don't think I'm as proud as most. And God says, what I want you to do is humble yourself and resist the devil. Get rid of it. Whoa. Look at what he says to do next. Draw nigh to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll draw not. He'll re, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. All of this for pride. You've got to understand, this is an egregious sin. This sin sets God against you. I mean, it's here in the book of James. It's in the book of Peter. God says, I will resist the proud. But God says, I want you, through humility, to vanquish this. But you've got to resist the devil, and you've got to draw nigh to God. The first law firm that I worked for, the man that was my boss was an incredible lawyer, a wonderful fella, a great trial lawyer. His name was Tom, and Tom taught me how to try lawsuits. He was brilliant. Tom wasn't saved. And Glorianne, my wife and I, witnessed to him and gave him all kinds of materials and things. And I said, Tom, I just want to see you get saved. And Tom was polite in the beginning, but after a while he got a little testy. And finally Tom said, David, look, enough's enough. He said, I got a whole bookshelf full of the books you've given me. I got two drawers full of the tracks you've given me. You and your wife have invited me out to eat now six times. And it wasn't to get a meal, it was to talk to me about getting saved. And he said, I've had enough. And these were his words, I want you to button it up. Stop it, I've had enough. I said, oh, Tom, come on, please. I want to see you go to heaven. He said, David, you hear me? You bring it up one more time, I'll fire you. I said, Tom, I don't want you to do that, but boy, I don't want you to miss heaven. I went home and told Glory Ann and she said, well, how about if we invite him to this special businessmen's banquet and we have Tom go as a last resort? I said, that's a great idea. I went and saw Tom the next day and I said, Tom, I know you said not one more time, but would you give me one more thing? Would you go to this banquet? There's going to be a bunch of Christian businessmen there. There'll be a great speaker, it'll be a great night. And just listen to what they have to say. He said, okay, I'll do it, but only on this condition. This is it. I'm done. If I go with you to this, no more. I said, well, let's go to it and then we'll talk. <laughs> I picked Tom up, we went to the banquet pastor. It was a great night. Oh, it was beautiful, great food, wonderful fellowship. There was about 800 Christians there, and unsaved people. 
And it got time for the speaker to stand up. And I will never, if I live to be 100, forget this speaker. I have never heard anybody so confused and disorganized and a complete lack of eloquence as this speaker. He got up in front of all these men and he started by saying, I've never done this before and I don't think they should have asked me to do this. And I told them I'm the wrong guy for this. And he repeated that three times. Then he got into his notes and he kept getting confused. And when he was going through his notes, a little bit of wind came across and they flew off on the floor. And he said, oh no, I'll never get them organized again. So I'll just have to read them in the order that I pick them up. <laughs> Literally. So he picks this page up and it says 0.7. Now we haven't heard 0.1 yet. It was horrible. And he kept losing his place. He's sweating. I, I mean, he, it's coming off his forehead. It's getting all over his Bible, all over his papers. And I'm watching this and I thought, I have never, never seen anything this bad. And then I got ticked off. I said, Lord, I did my point. I got Tom here. Look at what you brought. <laughs> I said, do you understand what a mess this is? And I'm sitting there with a little pad of paper, a little notepad, and I'm writing notes. How am I going to recover? What am I going to do? What am I going to say to Tom on the way home? How am I going to explain this goofing? What am I going to handle this? Well, finally, it says in the thing, he's supposed to speak for 22 minutes. He spoke for an hour plus. And the people were wanting him to wrap it up. Finally, the host says, uh, let's conclude it now. And when he said that, 200 men said, amen, amen. <laughs> let's conclude it. He said, okay, bow your heads. And he said, here's what I want to ask you. If you don't want to go to hell, and you know God ought to put you in hell, but you don't want to go, and he keeps raising his voice, but you don't want to go to hell, and you don't want God to put you in hell, and you want God to save you, and boy, now he's really pitching. Hold your hand up. And I thought, has he never heard how to do it? <laughs> when he said, hold your hand up, 400 men held their hands up, including Tom. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, you don't understand. <laughs> you probably think we're voting to get out of here or something. <laughs> you don't have it right. The hand scared him. He said, it's obvious you don't understand what I was saying. Take your hands down. And I thought, don't say that. <laughs> Takes forever to get them up. And he did the whole thing again, only louder. And he said, you don't want to go to hell, and you know God ought to put you in hell because you're a sinner. But you want Jesus to save you tonight. Hold your hand up. That's what I meant. And all the hands went up again. And I'm looking at my friend Tom, and Tom's crying. Tears are coming down. And he looked at me, and he said, David, is this what you've been trying to tell me? That 
And I said, well, kinda. <laughs> Maybe not exactly, but kinda. <laughs> that night, just under 500 men came to the altar and got saved. When it was all done, this young man, the speaker, came up to me. And he said, Brother Gibbs, I'm no good at this. And I said, well, boy, look, though. He said, yeah, but I told God, if I don't have your power, I've got nothing. And he said, Brother Gibbs, I was terrified tonight. But God took over. He said, they should have had somebody else do it. I said, no, sir, son. God had the right man do it. Because I'm telling you, you resisted the devil. And you drew nigh to God. Oh, he said, I did that. I told God, I got to have you because I got nothing. Pride makes us think we can do it. Pride makes us think we have the ability. And if I just had your help a little bit, Lord, we could do a lot. And God says, stop it. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Read verse 10 and we're done. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And here's the promise. He shall lift you up. Not maybe. God says, you humble yourself, I promise you, I'll lift you up. You want to see what you can do? Or do you want to see what God can do? Now notice it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If we're not careful, we play this little game of humbling ourselves in each other's sight. And the problem with that is we can fool each other. Nobody fools God. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Draw nigh to God and he shall lift you up. I'm afraid there's been a whole bunch of things, Pastor Chapel, in my life that I gave it my best shot. I worked hard, I was diligent, but it was just me. And that's all pride. What would it take for you to say, I don't want to see what I can do. I want to see what God can do. I'm going to resist the devil. I'm not going to live with rats in my house. I'm going to draw nigh to God. He's promised if I do that, he'll draw nigh to me. And by the grace of God, I'm going to humble myself in God's sight. And the God I serve without exception says, I'll lift you up. The choice tonight is yours. Joey Chestnut, that's quite a feat. But spiritually, that's nothing. What would you like to see God do? Through you, resist the devil. Draw nigh to God. Humble yourself and get the pride gone.
That verse that says, humble yourself, is written in the continuum. That means it isn't something we do once. It's something we do and we keep doing it. Humble, humble, humble. Be careful with compliments. People to be kind say gracious things. And then we start thinking we're something. No. Without him, we can do nothing. But tonight I invite you. I don't know what you're facing. But humble yourself. And my God has promised he'll lift you up.